Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Last night in Boca Chica, Texas, Elon Musk had his big Starship presentation. It was on the 11th anniversary of SpaceX's first successful launch to orbit, and they had a Falcon 1 just sitting out there for everyone to look at. And the thing is, this camera angle doesn't show you just how small that is compared to the Starship. The drone shots give you a much better idea of the comparative size. And again, to be clear, that is just the first stage of a Falcon 1. That is the second stage of a Starship slash Super Heavy. The Starship as it is is about 50, you know, 52 meters high with the landing gear. And that actually makes it shorter than a full Falcon 9 stack. The difference is, this is the upper stage and this is going to be able to perform a full ascent and landing and return in one piece. In the last few years, SpaceX have really managed to master the reuse of the first stages, which is just one part of making their rockets cheaper than anyone else. But making those second stages recoverable and reflyable from orbital velocities is beyond what they can do with the current design. That's what Starship is all about, and it is one key to Elon's exciting future, full of wonder and possibility out among the stars. That's a future I want for sure. And so this is the message that he brought to the audience. And, you know, the audience was interesting because on one hand, you had the media, you had the hardcore SpaceX fans that had been going down to Boca Chica to watch this thing get built. But there was also a lot of local townspeople that just had had this rocket essentially turn up on their doorstep. There were people that had worked on the rocket as mechanics, you know, welders, people that basically made this prototype possible. And those people didn't necessarily seem as excited about the concept of making life multiplanetary. Yeah, and this is what Starship is. It's all about making rapidly reusable rockets. And that requires a radical redesign of how rockets are built. Around this time last year, SpaceX were uh, pitching Starship as being made of high-grade carbon fiber composites using custom tooling. This year, they switched over to using you know, stainless steel welded in a field. And that is a pretty radical redesign, but it has good underpinnings. So the design that they're looking at now has only the two fins with six landing legs at the bottom. It still has the same forward fins. Uh, the dry mass, by the way, here is supposedly a misprint. It's more likely to be 120, although Elon's like, maybe we can make 110, maybe we can make it 100. But Elon makes a great case for switching to stainless steel. First of all, it's a grade of stainless steel which gets stronger when it's uh, cooled to cryogenic temperatures, which really helps since you're filling the whole thing with cryogenic fuel. But moreover, it gets to uh, high temperatures on re-entry and it will retain its structural strength to significantly higher temperatures. And that's really important to reusability because it means their thermal protection system can be a whole lot thinner, a whole lot lighter, and it doesn't need fancy ablators or anything to make sure that they can get rid of the excess energy that are uh, you know, from returning to Earth. Now, in theory, the space shuttle had a fully reusable uh, heat shield, but that was had to be quite thick because it was transferring heat into an aluminium airframe. Transferring into stainless steel means that it can be a lot thinner. In the case of STS-27, they famously had uh, heat shield damage which actually exposed the structure of the space shuttle and it was just a fluke that the piece of material underneath it was a piece of steel rather than a piece of aluminium. If it had been uh, aluminium, they could very well have lost that orbiter on re-entry. Moreover, the space shuttle was only designed to return from the relatively sedate speeds of low Earth orbit, whereas Starship is supposed to return from other planets and therefore will be going at escape velocity or above. The update to the flight dynamics using only two fins was kind of as expected. It certainly didn't surprise anyone that had been watching all the Kerbal Space Program players try to figure out how to do this in the game. But for those of you who have ignored video games because you think they're for kids, this is falling on its belly using the fins as essentially large air brakes. You can see that they only rotate along the long axis of the spacecraft. They're not like fins that pitch up and down like uh, canards or tail fins. Now if you look, that's 66 meters per second. This is a final descent. Actually re-entering, they have to you use aerodynamic lift. And you see here, Elon, instead of using Kerbal Space Program, he's actually trying to demonstrate the flight using his hands. Uh, and then, of course, he realizes that they actually have 
videos to show it. Because this has a lift to drag ratio which is not compatible with horizontal landing, it has to transition to a vertical landing by using the combination of the thrust vectoring on those engines and uh, the reaction control thrusters which are currently going to be cold gas nitrogen thrusters. In the Q&A afterwards, he did put a sort of time scale on when they will be switching from these cold gas thrusters that are very simple to much simpler hot gas reaction control thrusters. Anyway, for the main engines, we all know that it has going to have three Raptor engines that are sea level and three vacuum engines around the outside. The three sea level engines will be the ones that provide thrust vectoring, whereas the vacuum engines will provide high efficiency. As it is, the prototype only has three sea level Raptors installed and they're not even properly installed. Eagle eyed people have noticed that they're not actually hooked up correctly in every place and two of them have never been fired on a test stand as far as we can tell. So they are going to be taking those out and shipping them off to McGregor for full burn in testing before they bring them back. So while this prototype has been built in under six months, there's still a couple of months worth of work to do on it before it actually flies. By this point they've built about a dozen Raptor engines and the, the specs are certainly getting closer to being uh, firmed out. So yeah, 200 tons of thrust, a specific impulse of 330 at sea level, rising to 355 in vacuum. But the vacuum engines are even better with those big engine bells. They get 220 tons of thrust and 380 seconds. We got some glorious new test footage of the Raptor firing on a test stand. This is using subcooled methane propellant, and that means that they have to chill it down right towards its uh, freezing point rather than its boiling point. SpaceX uh, have to use pure methane. They can't use natural gas because then things like propane and ethane and butane will freeze down to solids, and you don't want solids in your fuel supply. Look at the Mach diamonds on that. Isn't that gorgeous? According to Elon, the main blocker to building the spacecraft right now is actually the engine production and that's going to be even more important when they look to build the Super Heavy which is going to have a whopping 37 Raptor engines. Between this and Starship, the whole stack will mass about 5,000 tonnes, so 37 engines gives them a thrust of about 7,400 tonnes, a thrust to weight of about 1.5. And he made it clear that when you're building a reusable booster, then you really want to make sure your thrust to weight ratio isn't too low because then you're just wasting a lot of fuel fighting gravity losses early on. One new feature we're seeing here is fins slash landing legs, which is obviously going to be very important since this thing is going to have to be recoverable in the same way the Falcon 9 is. The, uh, the one difference, though, is that they're hoping that they won't need to perform an entry burn. Falcon 9, before it hits the densest parts of the atmosphere, fires its engines to slow down, and that reduces the amount of damage uh, to the heat shield at the bottom of the spacecraft. They have tried to land with minimal entry burns or no entry burns, and it has not generally gone well for them. If you recall, Peter Beck of Rocket Lab described the converging shock waves around the geometry of the engine bells to be like plasma knives. That's a terrible accent. Yeah, so whole stack is going to be 180 meters tall, but it's going to sit on top of a 20, 30 meter tall flame diverter because with 37 engines, you want to make sure that as little of that force gets redirected back up into the bottom of the rocket. You can see just how tall that flame diverter is compared to the facilities next to it. So this is actually supposed to be a spaceport at Boca Chica, Texas. Yeah, this is not the Cape in Florida, but there we go. Look at that awesome, awesome idea. I think also having those legs inside fins at the base of the rocket should help with passive stability when you consider that there are aerodynamic surfaces up the top. If there's any glitch, you could find the whole thing flipping around. If, of course, you play Kerbal Space Program, you've had that happen before. Uh, this thing is going to perform a return to launch site, although in this animation, they only use the single center engine, but Elon said specifically that they will use the cluster of seven engines in the middle for boost back, and then they can use three for the landing. So here it is coming down on the landing legs, and I'm not sure, but I think you actually see little feet come out of those landing legs. So the Starship boosts to orbit and then spends some time there where it meets up with its buddy. 
Because one of the big things that this is going to need to do is refuel in low Earth orbit. It can just get to orbit with a small amount of propellant, enough to perform some maneuvers and landings. But to actually get to the Moon or to Mars, it's going to need to be able to refuel in orbit. And it's going to use a refueling variant of the Starship. Notice there's no windows on this one, although to be clear, one is showing the underside, one is showing the, uh, the top side. But the refueling variant will be able to carry enough fuel. It might take several refueling trips to actually get it ready to go to the moon. So there it's boosting off to the moon. Note that it is using the three outer vacuum engines because those get better specific impulse. Anyway, he understandably led off with landing on the moon because that is the, you know, by any means necessary is what the politics are saying. So saying that we can take the Starship to the moon is great, but it doesn't make a huge amount of sense necessarily to alt to be using Starships forever. The Starship is designed to enter atmosphere, planetary atmospheres. If they take it out to the moon, that's great. It technically probably is at the limit of its capabilities in terms of Delta V to go to the moon, land, and then come back to Earth without refilling beyond Earth orbit. But it makes a lot more sense if you could actually have a payload and have a lander that specifically goes, that's designed to, you know, doesn't need to enter atmosphere. So I think that while this may happen, I think that it will be very quickly replaced by specific spacecraft that are parked in low moon orbit that get refueled and they perform the landing themselves. Certainly it can make sense for starships to go out to the moon and then come back because then they are of course uh, can use the Earth's atmosphere for aerobraking and that saves a huge amount of potential you know, fuel requirements. Of course a lot of the initial development costs of Starship are being funded by Yosaka Maezawa who is just wanting to fly around the moon and not land so in that case the Delta V requirements are not so bad. It's also very clear that if you're landing large amounts of stuff on the moon, that one of the first things you want to bring is landing pads because the surface erosion spraying debris all over your stuff is going to be problematic. I also think this lunar base looks a lot like the design of Black Rock City, you know, Burning Man. And that too has problems with people's hardware getting messed up by uh, dust. We saw a nice render of Starship arriving at Saturn. And of course, you have to realize that it's actually slowing down here in reverse, right? So, you know, it looks like it's traveling towards the right side of the screen. Spacecraft's actually traveling towards the left and slowing down. Saturn is obviously very interesting as a destination because it includes Titan, which has a thick atmosphere on it, and it also has several moons, which we now know have water geysers spraying water into space. So a lot of resources that can be harvested. And I think it's telling that Mars was the last thing he included his in his uh, slide deck here, because of course this was originally about going to Mars, but political winds have changed. Uh, the moon is where the potential money is, and if Starship can be part of that, no doubt Elon wants it to be. Uh, having said that, of course, Jim Bridenstine posted this rather um, you know, passive-aggressive tweet saying, well, we love how much work you're doing, but why is commercial crew late? And while I think many Twitter followers responded with, dude, all your rockets are late, uh, Elon was polite enough to say that 95% of SpaceX are working on Falcon 9 and Dragon. Like 5% of the company is working on this little project, which is a big project, which is moving very, very fast. And that's perhaps the most exciting thing that it has literally gone from nothing being built to having this monster thing, which will fly supposedly to 20 kilometers and then perform this belly flop descent to make sure the aerodynamics are correct. And we know this because actually there were a lot of really good questions being asked. Uh, the locals all disappeared. It's funny, you can see them driving off in the background. But yeah, the people left behind were the ones that knew how to ask some pretty good questions, generally. I mean, uh, we got some good uh, insights into the production rate of the Raptor engines, the mechanics that are going to be used to push hardware around, the testing schedule. So this is actually one of the best Elon presentations yet, despite the fact, yes, Elon is a terrible speaker and very awkward and the slide deck was, was bad and, you know, well, sort of half-assed, let's say. Uh, no, it was great because there was a lot of people in the audience that were absolute hardcore SpaceX believers that, you know, wanted to believe the dream 
And not only that, they were technical enough that the questions that got asked were not simple softball journalism questions or weird hanger-on questions. They were actually good technical questions in many cases that revealed a lot more things that hadn't been necessarily in the presentation. Of course, you've got Elon making suggestions of to timetables after the fact, and I don't think they're going to hit any of those timetables. I think they'll be lucky to fly it before the end of the year, but that's just me being sceptical, and I really hope that they manage to make this fly and manage to make this work. It will be absolutely amazing, and I'm looking forward to the day when people can fly into space or fly from one city to another. I'm also really crossing my fingers that this thing doesn't fall apart at hypersonic speeds because the the welding system hasn't been finalized. One interesting tidbit, incidentally, is that they're currently welding it out of plate stainless steel. They're, the next versions they're going to go to, they're going to basically get rolls of stainless steel from the mill and have one weld per turn. So they're going to have a single seam up the back, more or less. Uh, so that'll, that'll obviously mean there's fewer things to weld. It'll make it faster and it will no doubt make it stronger. Another tidbit is that right now there's no plans for any refrigeration of the cryogenic materials. They're going to sit inside the header tanks, which are inside the larger tanks, and the larger tanks can essentially be uh, evacuated, so they will slow the uh, heat loss to space low enough that they can actually travel to Mars and then have propellant left for landing on the Martian surface. But that, of course, is decades out. What's going to happen in the near future, though, is this Starship is almost certainly going to be disassembled again. It was stacked up for this presentation, but it looks like the racetrack fairing was not completed, and I think that's where they're going to take it apart into two segments. Those engines are obviously going to go off and get tested so that they are able to test fly the whole thing. So there's a lot of work to do in the next few months, and maybe by the end of the year it will fly its 20 kilometer test flight. The other, of course, big problem here is that they need to get permission from the FAA to fly things, and the FAA is not comfortable with the fact that people live in a little hamlet in Boca Chica, far too close to the test site. SpaceX would love to buy them out, but right now, many of the people are resisting. After all, some of the people have been living there for a while, and some of the people moved there specifically to be close to SpaceX. And the thing is, the buyout offer was something like three times the market value of the property, plus access to SpaceX events. It's definitely something that they're going to have to deal with because they're not going to be able to do some of these tests in Florida by the sound of things. Uh, if they do, it's going to require, uh, you know, they're also working on the um, on the, the launch facility there. There's people seeing hardware going up now. Elon's schedules are all very much optimistic, hoping that everything all works on schedule and everybody works 80-hour weeks and everything happens perfectly and everyone agrees. And more realistically, things always end up taking a little longer than that. So yeah, it was a definitely an interesting presentation. You should go and watch the full thing. I also did a live Twitch stream where I sort of talked about it at the same time and drank some beer. You can watch my full version of that. Uh, but I'll be back to making regular science videos soon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.